So um, first of all, thanks for inviting me, giving the, me the opportunity to um, to present this uh, work. Um, yeah, I'm Henrik. I uh, I work from uh, Roskilde University today. I'm a trained agronomist. Uh, I've been working with intercropping, like Lambert was saying, on and off for a long time. Uh, in the stars, uh, very inspired by um, by looking at the competitive interactions between different species, uh, understanding how cereal and legumes could kind of work together. Uh, the whole thing about um, improving uh, land use, uh, growth resources, and so forth. Uh, and that is basically my still my motivation here. Uh, since I started at Roscoe University six years ago, I had the opportunity to uh, work more and closer to to uh, the actual actors out there in the field and um, and that's what I'm really interested in and I'm trying to improve my my skills and competences within that and uh, I'll just introduce you to some of our work and um, like uh, I, I expect to do that this, this within uh, no more than 30 minutes and then of course feel free to ask questions and so on afterwards because I can't see the chat, then I think it's easier that I will just uh, do my presentation and then we'll have the dialogue afterwards. All right, so um, so this about uh, implementing intercropping is uh, is uh, the main topic and my front page on my first slide here is, is from the EU. That is, uh, 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 yeah, was titled Future of the CAP post 2020 we expect we are waiting for the new cap coming up now and uh, for me it's interesting to see that um, it's a pretty um, system pretty much system approach evaluation that they ask for it's about the sector's resilience it's about uh, reinforcing environmental care it's about improving life in rural areas and of course intercropping is in there somewhere playing a um, potentially playing a part in in this in these um, ambitions so um, the content is that i will try to put it up in like in four four sections the first one is titled the farmer is the boss and this, the next one from passive to active mutual learning efficient transition and then some questions and dialogue from your side um, my main activities is uh, around two ongoing uh, projects. You heard a lot about Remix and uh, I'm also part of the Lake Value project. And uh, my role there together with colleagues is to try to work on what we call the demand driven approaches. So, so we have our knowledge, of course, our scientific background, but we try to to uh, motivate uh, and, and and stimulate the the different uh, actors that we group or or that we try to integrate with so so it is basically what they find most challenging or most promising that that's where we start our collaboration so that is a main principle that we go with the actor uh, and we have different uh, ways of doing it and i'll get back to that so these two projects is um, is uh, ongoing. Uh, just before starting up on these horizon projects, I was part of another uh, EU project called uh, Climate Cafe, and that was just when I started at the university, Roskilde University, and it was very inspiring for me to 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 go from the lab to the to the farmers' uh, fields, and this is uh, some of the farmers we work with. I was actually trying to follow a group of 14 farmers practicing conservation agriculture for, for four years. And we have papers coming up, but I've just um, enclosed one paper uh, coming up la out last year where we conclude that uh, these experience exchange groups that we were following, just one of them, 14 years old, um, we could see that uh, this interaction between farmers were crucial when we talk about transitions their way of um, trusting each other, their way of uh, understanding uh, the different arguments coming up from colleagues was really pushing uh, their, um, their ability to change. So that was, of course, for me, a kind of a game changer, um, exploring it, so trying to, to work more and more with the qualitative uh, data collections. 
and uh, it was really encouraging to see how these interactions between these colleagues could actually be used in order to um, to improve, uh, in this case, conservation and agriculture. But in the in the paper from this quotation, I'll just title it "Sustainable Practice Practices That We Could See Could Be Permanently Adopted," not due to scientific findings necessarily, but more due to these. Um, repet repetitive nature of interactions in this group. So altogether, that was really uh, that was motivating me, moving in this direction of of uh, implementations. So before starting getting into some of the examples I have with me today, we could start with some clarifications. So what we talk about here, intercropping, is not new. We have a history of at least 1,000 years, maybe longer. Intercropping systems offers alternative for a more sustainable agriculture will reduce inputs and stabilize yields. I imagine that is some of the things that you discussed over this course. So you could ask what is not to like when we talk about intercropping. Nevertheless, we can see that there's a very limited area of the total global arable land are intercropped as a strong decline. And we can also see that, um, especially in the last decade, uh, this uh, cropping strategy has been rediscovered by scientific uh, research. And that is, and you have seen some excellent presentations, I'm sure, from some of the leading scientists in the in the area, in the different areas. So my point is, it's not new. It's not adapted, even though we can see it has a lot of really important. Uh, Agroecosystem functions and services that we could benefit from. And a part of this is uh, the farmer. Uh, of course, the farmer is the decision maker. The farmer is uh, um, taking the decisions on whether intercropping is beneficial or not. And uh, at least from my side, we I have to um, realize that um, even though I've been in this area for a long time, my ability to uh, convince these farmers to grow intercrops has been very limited. Um, so, of course, this is about how can we get in dialogue and how can we motivate the farmer and how can we argue that this is a relevant uh, strategy for them to use. So the farmer is the boss. You have to realize, and I'm sure many of you already do that, that a farmer is a very skilled uh, person. It's, it's a person having the capacity to cope with the system like this that I just indicated here. You can see that you have the pea barley intercrop here uh, to the right here. But, but even though we focus on the intercropping strategies, this is just one part of a, quite a big uh, puzzle. In this case here, there's livestock systems connected. Uh, there's a rotation, catch cropping strategies. Uh, this, uh, this guy here with the straw in his mouth, he's uh, focusing also on emissions. There's a lot of focus on, on this from climate issues. There's a rotation diversification. There's a, there's a value chain that you have to fit into in order to make profit of your business and so forth. So my point is that that we have to understand that when you optimize a system as a farmer, it's not a, like a single factor optimization. And a farmer is that is a commercial business. So it's also about how can you actually see the production here as part of a larger network, a larger network of other actors, and and this uh, we IIFM is one in it for me. What's in it for me? So that is of course what the farmers are talking about when they are changing strategies. What's in it for me? How can I get a benefit from this new strategy? If we look into to a farm, uh, then this is a picture of a, of a farm. You can see that there's many things going on. There's, uh, for instance, something about other farmers. What would other farmers actually say when they see a, a um, intercrop on the field with the 
diversity and so on, and they are used to to, to see a um, a cereal uh, monocrop, for instance, without weeds, without any anything else than this uh, main crop. So um, this is just a picture about all the some of the elements that that you can uh, Im that is actually going on when you look at the farm and and uh, and I, of course this is not complete but just looking at the program then then maybe some of these issues is what you have discussed in this course but as you can see there's many more and basically we need to be able to to uh, to deal with these many multi-factor approaches uh, that uh, the farmer is actually dealing with when we go in dialogue of course my experience is that uh, that this is simply too hard for us as uh, as a scientist we have our different expertises but what we can do is that we can actually learn from the farmer learn how to to deal with this and listen to what they are telling us and in that uh, way if we are able to do that then um, then we're also able to increase implementation i'm sure and i'll get back to how we can be able to that to do that we had uh, yeah and, and just finally this is about looking at this from from different uh, angles it could be economy it could be environment it could also be some social dimensions all is included and that's also what we normally do when we talk about sustainable development we don't talk about environment as a single factor we talk about this uh, united approach where we are dealing with both economy, environment and social dimensions. That is simply needed. And if we are not doing that, then we're not talking about sustainable development. All right. We had a study uh, just a few years ago where we had uh, 14 quite uh, heavy interviews. Unfortunately, this is in Danish. It's not, it's not actually the text that I will introduce to you. It's, it's more the complexity. So from uh, 14 interviews, uh, deep interviews, we were trying to, um, to focus on, on what kind of uh, parameters was included when the farmers were discussing and uh, how to diversify catch cropping. Uh, when you had this crop growing in, in autumn in, in Denmark, where we have uh, normally um, a low uh, uh, biomass production, we have heavy, uh, we have the main, main participate, uh, uh, rainfall, and that means also that we have these downwards water movements. So we have, we have a lot of focus on catch cropping in our environments. So looking at that, again, like the previous slides, just to indicate to you, this is about catch cropping, but this is also about, uh, according to these 14 farmers, this is about mycorrhiza, it's about uh, erosion, it's about um, seed bed preparation, it's about regulation and so forth and so forth. So this is just to say that when you are talking about uh, intercropping implementation, um, then uh, we have to deal with, or we have to understand that, that many factors are actually going into the final decision taken by the individual farmer that we talk to. A very inspiring paper, I think, according to, to going with the farmer or trying to understand this, the, the, the farming system, is this uh, quite old paper by Altieri, where he is uh, writing about these traditional farmers in South America, where they have a enormous uh, diversity going on and they have a deep understanding of, of using this type of, of diversity uh, bo uh, both uh, single species but also intercropping strategies uh, how how they can use that for, for according to, to to approach food security conservation of biodiversity and so on and the message from Altieri and I completely agree is that uh, Many of us, we need to try to understand and read into these ancient practices to learn from that. And they, this is a, a very comprehensive knowledge they have over generations and for generations. And, um, and uh, we might need to, um, to, to go a little bit back and understand these systems better by looking at these. It's not a lot, but still we have a few places around the world where this very high diversity strategy is still going on. And we need to learn from that when we want to improve or we want to implement that in our 
um, cropping strategies. In Remax, we have uh, this uh, approach. We have decided to to establish what we call 11 multi-actor platforms. Robin is responsible for the one in the top here in Scotland, um, and we have one in the Netherlands, and you can see more or less uh, all over Europe. The, the idea is to get closer in contact with these farmers, with the, the people who, um, who are influencing the intercropping strategy or the species mixes that we want to um, uh, that we want to increase in area in Europe, or at least we have the, um, an ambition of doing it. And uh, the, the thing is that we have decided to have like a central field, a kind of a classical demonstration of different, um, different intercrops, different options. Uh, it's co completely controlled by the local map responsible. So that means what is going on in Sweden, what they, what they decide to to demonstrate in the classical demonstration field, like I, I, I assume many of you know what that is. It's basically a field where you where you seed your things and you have some scientists or extension, uh, some advisors coming, uh, inviting farmers to, 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 to some events and then you discuss and, and what you see and why this is good and bad and so on. So this is a classical dissemination event. Uh, from that we from the start, expected that some of the farmers participating in these kind of demonstrations, they would take some of these strategies back home and, tr and try it out on their individual uh, farms. And that is what we have titled satellite farms. Um, as you can imagine, because it is demand driven, then it's very different what type of uh, intercrops is introduced in Poland compared to, to Greece, for instance, or north of Spain. And that is the whole purpose of this work. We would like to do it. Uh, uh, we will. The driver is that it should be relevant for the actors participating, and that means we have a rich picture of many different intercrops, many different strategies. Some of the maps are, ve are still very focused on the demonstrations. Other maps have left the demonstrations, like the Danish one, because it was not very uh, efficient, and we have used much more effort on the satellite farms. We are just about to, to wrap it up, and uh, it's um, uh, my colleague from uh, Louis Balk in the Netherlands, Abko de Boek, who is um, responsible for that. So I will not take, take his data. I will stay with, just for you, just as an example, I will just show you some of the Danish uh, data that we have. The purpose was from the start, and that's not Denmark, sorry, that is the whole uh, multi-actor approach in Remix. That is that we have a technical approach for sure, because we can we have different strategies to use. We have seeding densities, we have species combinations and so on. Some of the things that you have learned during this course, but there's also social dimension. And in principle, we will not separate this. This is a united social technical analysis. We start with the demonstrations, as you can see up here, but we also go with the single farmer to learn what is actually happening on his or her field. Uh, according to the uh, specific uh, intercrop chosen by this individual farmer. So it's a combination. The interesting thing is that we have the demonstration, which is a classical, like uh, we call it a doctor patient situation. The, the expert is explaining to the farmer, listen, uh, you have to do like, like this. Uh, this is the starting point, but what we would like to, to work with is, is more to, to use the starting point to initiate some more diffuse innovation strategies. And I'll get back to that. But but that means this is, this is a kind of innovation strategy that we are not controlling. It's just happening. We don't know exactly how. We try to facilitate it, but we are not in control of the strategy. Starting off with the demonstration, I'll get back to the to the satellite farmers. There's a new study coming up from my, my PhD students. It's just published. published. Uh, it's a collaboration between our colleagues in um, Navarra, Spain, and uh, some new colleagues actually outside the Remix project from the Ghent University in Belgium. In short, it's just to say that we have tried to look into the demonstrations, which is a cl this classical dissemination event, trying to get in contact with the farmers, and we have uh, looked at researcher observations. Uh, what are the different researchers actually observing? How are they evaluating this? 
kind of adaptation of new knowledge uh, by the farmer. How are the the farmers saying? We had we have had some part, uh, participant surveys, and um, from that we realized across these sites seven uh, events. No, three, four, five, six, seven events. Yes, we have also tried to to um, ha uh, to get a closer um, understanding of uh, the participants because sometimes these surveys are not really so. Um, there, there could be. They, sometimes they're quite simple, and it's very hard to get the farmers to really write explanations. They like to give crosses on. On basic informations, but this about creating a focus group was was used in order to get more information out. It was um, we tried to triangulate it all and and to evaluate what type of information was actually used. Was it possible to go from the administration to really see uh, innovations by the farmer? And we have we conclude in this paper here that uh, we actually need to put more emphasis on these focus groups, even after triangulation, we need to go further into analyze our data in order to understand uh, what is working and what is not working. So there's actually much more work to be done in order to make these demonstrations efficient according to implementation strategy and an adaptation by farmers. If we look at the satellite farmers in Denmark, we, we decided to leave this demonstration strategy. It was not very fruitful for us. Um, we had some challenges by the extension services hosting some of these events. They were not so supportive to intercropping. So we decided already one year uh, into the remix project that we would have like a volunteer group of farmers interested in um, in intercropping. So we just put up a poster at an event and, and uh, these uh, 16 farmers uh, joined and we have followed them for about three years now. And as you can see, uh, again, farmers are different. This is located, this is small Denmark, you can see here to the left, and we have them located primarily on the on Sealand, the island Sealand, uh, but also two farmers here on Jutland and also two farmers here on Funen. Anyway, what I would like to point out is that we have here farmers with uh, this different sizes in, in, the, in the area they are um, cropping. This age from 23 to uh, 63, and so forth. So, it's a, so farmers are special. That's normally what we say. They're unique, and we have to understand the uniqueness when we want to implement things. Um, we have worked with them, and you can see them here. Some of them. Uh, we have worked with them for for three years, uh, starting out with a uh, visit at the farm with an in-depth uh, interview. We had activities in their local fields. I will, I will show you a picture in a minute. And we have done activities where we where we share uh, these different experiences together in the group. And you have to uh, remember that these people, they, do, they didn't know each other beforehand. They were completely new. They were just interested in, in species mixtures for different reasons. One farmer here, he's an excellent um, um, arable farmer. Very interested in in optimizing his uh, his cropping strategies. Uh, this guy, he's a pig producer, conventional pig producer. He know that he knows that growing, for instance, faba bean with wheat is a very good fodder for his uh, piglings. And and uh, this guy is, a, is he is uh, running a big estate in north of of Zealand, uh, looking after efficient ways of uh, growing. Uh, High value crops, and he has a, a big equipment to, to sort and separate and so forth. All all kinds of histories behind these farmers, and that means also basically different strategies when we talk about implementation, different interests. And uh, over three years, we have seven events, and Anna has just uh, submitted her paper. It's in press of uh, in the Journal of Agricultural Systems now and you can read more about it there. But it's just to say this is a progression we try to, to build, a progression decided by the group themselves. So again, we have this demand-driven approach. And according to us and also the evaluation we get for the farmers, we have had quite, an, quite a successful um, journey together. I will just show this to you, just for you again to remember, this is uh, an event, uh, activity we did together with them. 
everyone received such a Terra Gold uh, catch crop mix, and uh, they received in it uh, in June, and they had to seed it whenever they they could fit it into their different um, uh, cropping strategies, and also when they thought it was the right time for seeding and so forth. And you can see here this basic diagram uh, that there is quite a high variability. This yields down to uh, just one ton of dry matter per square meter, up to about five tons. So I will not go in detail. You can see these different farmers. It's just again to underline that when we talk about implementation of intercrops, we talk about farmers, single farmers. We have to uh, realize that this is uh, it's very individual and and farmer knowledge, their um, equipment, their ability to 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 do uh, things uh, whenever it's, it's timely and so on, their knowledge level so forth is of course very diverse. We used internal diffuse knowledge sharing. We use WhatsApp, many of you might know that also, and we are just about to analyze all the different messages, all the different dialogues that we have had over more than two years. We had also, uh, or we have an activity. We have 926 uh, members now on this uh, Danish uh, Facebook group, opening up for for different aspects of of intercropping. Uh, and of course, we also we have just hired in a company who will make some uh, analysis on all the different conservation. Uh, uh, conversations we've had over also about two, two and a half years now. So this is again to say that it's, it's, it's driven by the farmer, it's driven by the people interested in this, and uh, we can see that it's working. The knowledge sharing is very efficient. So my final couple of slides here is that uh, this is my, and, and I'm open if you disagree, of course, this is my uh, thinking on how to get a um, efficient transition. This is actually to get it out, uh, to, to uh, leave it open for the different actors to use it and to optimize, to change it, to modify it according to their local needs. What we realize and what we also, and I guess many of you also experience that, is that um, things are changing now. I mean, the food systems are at a crossroad, at least that's what I, that's what I titled here. There's a diet shift going on and so on, and the farmers are, of course, navigating according to that. There's a pressure on our livestock production in Europe. People are imagining a much uh, higher level of plant-based diets that is influencing our land use strategy and the strategies, and the farmers are really trying to figure out what to do, what is the right strategy. And you can imagine in a country like Denmark, Holland, other places where you have a lot of animals. Of course, these farmers are also a little bit uh, nervous about this new um, new uh, situation. So that is one thing. So that means there is actually a potential now for implementing new things because farmers are, are, are seeing that things are, are changing. Another thing is that we have a problem, I think, a severe problem when we talk to the farmers. We have this food supply uh, funnel that so you can see that uh, there's these buying disc manufacturers, supermarket uh, formats and so on, narrowing in the funnel. So that is this is a, a funnel indicating uh, influence. So, so there's a little, the connection between the farmer and the consumer in the end are very poor. It's actually not controlled by the farmer. The, the people who actually know how to do things is controlled by, by other types of businesses. And I believe that we need to look at that. We need to create another funnel in, in order to get a closer contact between uh, the producer and the consumer. And if that's possible, then we can also argue that our intercrops is is interesting also for the consumer to, to, um, to buy and maybe even pay a little bit extra for. So my conclusion is that um, Implementation of intercropping requires various perspectives. Don't expect a silver bullet um, a solution. Uh, it requires knowledge of different on different levels, scientific knowledge, but also practice knowledge. And um, I believe very much in local networks. They are very valuable for the farmers when they have to digest the science, the experience. 
and if we can have this more diffuse approach, this also a more open environment, and uh, then uh, you are opening up for a high level of creativity that we know at least the best farmers are able to um, uh, or have. Um, uh, then uh, the co-creation approach or co-design in the remix project, the sign just as a facilitator is very important. So it's not a, a doctor patient, it's actually a facilitating role and then trust. And I think that's that will, that will be my final message to all of, all of you that trust is central. That's what I learned when I was following the cons conservation agriculture farmer for more than four years. Um, this is very central. If we want to implement, we need to have trust and uh, and that is not easy. Um, this is a respect for everyone. So when you as a scientist meet the farmers and you want to try and discuss something about intercropping implementation, then really you need to work to gain that trust and and I must also say that when you gain that trust, then you 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 will be able to to uh, create a fascinating collaboration where you can learn a lot from these experts uh, in in practice knowledge. <laughs>